Yep, yep. Okay, then I'll share my screen. All right, we got two minutes to go. Okay. Da -da -da. <laughs> <clears throat> Oh, good. We're live. Okay. I'll press the play. Sure. Yep. Okay. So we, we managed to go live um, two minutes ahead of time instead of 10 minutes ahead of time. Those solar flares or whatever's happening is not going to stop us today. <laughs> yeah. So now once we go live, announcements get sent out to about 15,000 people. So. Wow. By the way, Jeff, thanks so much for sending me the Bigelow essays. Oh, you are very welcome. Wow. <laughs> wow. They need to be you know, widely distributed. So uh, I was happy to do it. And uh, it was, of course, really Robert Bigelow who generously you know, totally. yes. offered to uh, give yeah. the out to hundreds of people. Yes. You know, I'm writing a piece on consciousness at the border of life and death mm -hmm. for current opinion in behavioral sciences where they really like to make a lot of emphasis on recent publications. So I'll make sure I highlight those there. Okay. That'll be great, Alex. This is nice that uh, we can set it up this way where you're the one sharing your screen and I'm the one linking to Zoom. That's true. We've never done it that way. Okay, here we go, Emmy. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I'm Jeffrey Meshlove. The live stream is beginning right now. I'm here with my co-host, Emmy Vadness, and our special guest for today, Alex Gomez-Marin. Alex, of course, has been a guest now several times on the New Thinking Aloud channel, and we hope to have him as a guest many more times and also as a guest host. That's our plan, and I'm <laughs> determined to make it happen. Alex is a very busy man. He is a physicist. He is also a neuroscientist, and he is the director of the Perry Center located in Italy, in Tuscany. It is a, a center where leading intellectuals uh, all over Europe convene. And Alex has been interviewing many of them. And also, Alex happens to be the author. I'm going to share my screen for a moment, if I may, so people can see this uh, article that just came out this week in science. There it is, Alex Gomez Marin, Experiencing Science. It is a book review of a book called The Blind Spot. And Alex uh, has a lot of praise for the authors of this book who talk about the visual blind spot that we all have, which makes it possible for us to see. It's where the optic nerve impinges on the retina. There's a blind spot in everybody's visual field. And the authors of this book suggest that consciousness itself is a big, glaring blind spot in science. Uh, however, Alex uh, has a little bit of a um, qualm about the book. And he argues here in the pages of science that uh, the authors would have done well to pay more attention to anomalous cognition on the edges of uh, awareness. In other words, I guess it's fair to say you were referring to the paranormal right there in the pages of Science Magazine. So welcome, Alex. We're delighted to have you with us. And maybe a, a good starting point for our conversation today is to tell our viewers a little bit about the Perry Center. So I, I think many 
of our viewers, half of whom are Americans and half global, um, don't know that much about the Perry Center. All right. Well, I'm, I'm so glad to be with you. The Perry Center is a, is a place in a little village in Tuscany, in Italy, founded by David Pitt, but late David Pitt, who was a physicist and also a colleague and friend and biographer of David Bohm, the quantum physicist. David went there back to Italy and decided to stay in this little village and started hosting people, having conversations, discussing about science, but with a really broad um, spirit in mind, so including the arts and the sacred. And that went on for quite many years until he unfortunately passed away. And then, well, Shantena Sabadini took over and they continued, the pandemic hit. And then we started having online events as well as in-person events. The magic of the place is really to go there. It's a really tiny village and it's some sort of alchemical vessel. So you can go there and we organize conferences, gatherings, and it's a superposition between, I would say, the virtues, or I hope, the virtues of academia, you know, well-known, thoughtful speakers, but also a more convivial attitude where we have lots of conversations over wine. And so it's, I think it's like what you do in your program. How can we be open-minded and rigorous at the same time and enjoy it? And so it's a center for new learning. And I'm delighted to go there from time to time to host some of the events. And we do also a lot online. So feel free to check it out at, at pariscenter.com. Thank, thank you for that, Alex. And I think it's also uh, important to let our viewers know that we're communicating from your office at the Neuroscience Institute in Alicante, Spain, where, where you're the director of uh, one of the laboratories there, I gather. I'm not sure I understand your official title, although I know you've done a lot of work on the nervous systems of Drosophila or fruit flies. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm a weird creature. I'm an anomalous creature studying anomalous phenomena because I studied physics, as some of our viewers may know, and then I transitioned into neuroscience, and then I started studying small creatures like fruit flies and worms, then mice. Then I said, well, the promise of neuroscience seems to be study brain slices of rats, and you'll understand the human mind, but that seems not to be paying. So I decided to start studying humans themselves, and I do this from here, from the Instituto de Neurociencias, when I'm an associate professor in, in Alicante, Spain. Uh, another point that I think is important to raise is, is that uh, by working with you, and I hope we uh, continue a, a long and uh, enjoyable partnership for many years, but it's an effort on our part and on your part and on the part of other mutual colleagues to uh, establish more of an international presence for the uh, kinds of discussions we have about consciousness, spirituality, and, and the paranormal. And I, I wanted to let our viewers know that we at New Thinking Allow go to some length to create uh, subtitles for all of our videos in seven different languages. And you've agreed to share that message with our viewers who may be with us uh, who don't speak English. So uh, this is probably as good a time as any uh, to do that. All right, here we go. So lo voy a hacer en castellano, en español, queridos amigos que nos estáis viendo, que habláis inglés, pero igual tenéis uh, familiares o, o conocidos que no hablan inglés lo suficientemente bien para escuchar estas conversaciones. Bueno, pues desde New Thinking Aloud, me decía Jeff antes de empezar, que están están poniendo mucho énfasis, un buen trabajo en traducir muy bien todas las conversaciones, que son muchas, como veis, todas las conversaciones que tienen en el canal. Y las han traducido al español, al portugués, al italiano, al francés, al ruso, al sueco y al alemán. Entonces, bueno, por lo menos nosotros, ¿verdad? Los hermanos hispanohablantes somos, ¿cuántos? 500 millones, 500 millones... <ríe> pues compartirlo, podéis compartir y tenéis que ir ahí a YouTube donde pone mostrar subtítulos y veréis que son de alta calidad, están muy bien traducidos, compartir los vídeos, ya sé que uno tiene que estar sentado leyéndolo, pero, pero es, un, es, un, es un buen regalo para que el mensaje 
no quede entre, lo que creo que hablaremos en un momento también en inglés, no quede entre los silos de los que hablan inglés, los que no hablan inglés, para que esto pueda ser un trabajo más global, que también estoy haciendo yo, siendo español, habiendo hecho un circuito internacional y ahora hablando en inglés, pero también tratando de que esto llegue a mi tierra. Un abrazo a todos. Gracias. <risa> de nada. Então, eu podia falar um bocadinho de português, mas não muito, mas também para os nossos irmãos do, do, do Brasil e de Portugal, estão os subtítulos no YouTube, então podem, podem clicar e são traduções de muita qualidade para poder escutar os, todos os vídeos que tem o canal no, na, na vossa bela língua. Um, um abraço. Good, we're getting some comments of people speaking and it looks like Spanish and maybe some, yeah, I think Spanish. So thank you for doing that. And I just want to also say hello and welcome, Alex. And I really enjoyed your conversations with Jeff. And um, I think that the neuroscience interface with consciousness is something that I'm really interested in learning more about from you as we go today and also take questions from the viewers. Yes, totally. That's the thing. We are all in one way or another working on that, I would say, just with different flavors, different backpacks, different his historical paths, maybe tuned to different aspects of it. But I think that's what we're working on, consciousness and the interface between what that is and our physical world. It's, it's a mystery. It's a fascinating mystery. Would you like to say a little more about consciousness as a blind spot. Totally, totally. So this book I recently reviewed, The Blind Spot by Frank Leiser and Thompson, it's, 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 del it's a delicious book. And it makes this analogy, uh, as you were saying, Jeff, at the beginning, that actually we can see because we have our optic nerve just sending the information from the eye to the brain. And precisely where we have that, that particular spot, is blind to our visual field, but you know, our brain does some tricks and we don't notice, but actually it could be, I, I do it sometimes in talks when we can show two dots and you can ask people to, you know, cover one eye and get closer and far away. And then one of the dots disappear and voila, here's the magic. There's something that's right now, not in our visual field. So taking that analogy, the authors say, well, there is some, something which is at the origin of everything we can do and say as scientists that we seem to constantly miss, and that's experience itself, embodied, lived experience. And this is the paradox. This is what I also like to call the, the Galilean knot. It's something we need to untie it, which, because, because it's because we, are, we have experience that we can, of course, enjoy and sing and, and, and love and all the rest, but also, also we can do science. And no, nothing, everything that we do in science has to come through our own experience. And yet science has been very good at just setting aside experience and saying, well, we'll just care about what we call objective. And there are all these isms that the book talks about, this kind of conceptual Frankenstein that's materialism, instrumentalism, reductionism, and so on. And this all makes the blind spot. And this book allows us to realize again how central experience is. And this is important in all mysteries in going on in current science. So this is important in physics, I would say in, in, in quantum mechanics, in relativity, this is important in biology, the question of what is life, in cognitive neuroscience, but the blind spot at its best, uh, it's in consciousness studies. So it's a very timely book so that we can, as the phenomenologists like to say, go back to experience and from it, um, well, first of all, honor it. And second, and that's still a challenge, it's ongoing work, I would say for everyone, how can we put it back with our abstractions of the natural world? World, because there's no doubt that mathematics and metaphysics uh, play a role. But as White had said, as Alfred North White had said, we can f f fall prey to the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. We 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 may think that that what is abstract is concrete. And an example would be the theories of everything. Here we have this abstract mathematical theory of everything, and we mistake that abstraction for concrete reality. And that's, and that's actually terrible.
Alex, how do you think scientists can become more aware of their blind spots? Yes. Well, they can hmm, they can read books and I read a lot of books, but ultimately I think what has to happen is that you get a very powerful experience that shakes you. That ultimately is very effective. It can also be dangerous or maybe not the way we would want it, right? So it's like we would want it smooth and slow, but because we don't work on it, then it can come all of a sudden. So spiritual awakening or even an accident or a new death experience or something really harsh that just makes us realize, well, where where where's my where am I standing on? And and that's always experience. But of course, through academic work, you can also do that. And that's why I was alluding to the, the, the phenomenologists. And the phenomenologists are not just people that just describe phenomena. By the way, the, the word phenomenal, phenomenon or phenomena has been abused, mistreated. It's like mechanism is first class. Where's the mechanism and phenomena? Whatever, what people say, anecdote. But the phenomenologists have done it very consciously for many for many years, going back to experience with these methods that sound like also even, even spiritual or even yogic method of epoche, you know, suspending ju judgment. It's, it's kind of an inner work. So I think it's very interesting where this inner work can blend with the, the looks outer work that scientists do. And, and so these are ways to work on our blind spots. And precisely because they're blind, too often we'll forget and we need to be reminded. And that's, I think that's also fine. We, we can and should indulge. Maybe a good analogy as well is when you, you take your glasses, you put them back on. So when I'm very concentrated on something, maybe when I'm doing math or when I'm, well, I, I, it's, it's fine if I'm not aware of the blind spot. That's fine. But the problem is that we need to go back and realize, zoom out and say, well, okay, I've been dealing with the leaves or the trees but now I need to see the forest and I need to understand what's going on. Otherwise, the claims that scientists make sound really like terrible philosophy. And so it's this exercise of you know, zooming in and zooming out that's, that's actually difficult. Yeah. And, and uh, attachments to um, processes or philosophies. Um, oh, yeah. So, but I, I really like what you say too about the experiences. And I also think as professionals, we can keep each other accountable as well. Well, that's that's also what science should be about because science, I mean, some people sometimes accuse me of being too constructivist as if I said, as if I meant that science is what we scientists make of it and we just make it up. But no, what I mean is that it's an intersubjective consensus. It's kind of a very precise game where, as you say, we keep each other in check and we say, well, that's how I see it. Well, that's how I see it. And so let's, let's keep, you know, let's rub it. There's some friction, maybe some fire, maybe some light in this fire mm -hmm. and we can, and, and exactly. We need to talk to each other and, and we are like mirrors to each other in our daily life and also in science. And the moment, the moment you don't have mirrors, then you don't know how you look anymore. It's strange. Also back to the, the isms. That there are many isms in this book that we were mentioning and others. Something that's problematic about the blind spot is that you carve your favorite ism, materialism, idealism, panpsychism, dual aspect monism. And that's great. But then that kind of, it's like as if you made a tattoo. Yeah, that's kind of yours. And then it's really hard to explore others. And I, I see this with a lot of people I talk that I really respect that they dig deeper and deeper and deeper, and then they cannot get out of this hole they've, they've dug. And, and so all these isms should be dealt with certain relativism in, in a healthy sense. Now I explore this view of the cosmos, and now let me, let me also be exploring this other one. And so these are the backpacks um, that we bring and we don't realize. And again, I think the realizing the blind spot is a way to feel light again, and then decide, well, I, I want to wear that backpack again, but we, we see a lot of, yeah, of these ism wars, wars in, in academia. Um, I enjoy them, but ultimately what matters is our concrete experience. We should not forget that, yeah. The um, main approach, I think, in philosophy, certainly, to discuss inner experience is phenomenology, uh, particularly starting with Husserl. And 
who, who if I recall correctly, was a uh, teacher to Heidegger. And uh, you, there's in your um, book review an interesting metaphor. You compare phenomenology with regard to both philosophy and science as to being an elevator that's stuck in the middle of two floors and it, it can't really reach either floor. Yes, Jeff. Wow. So we have 90 minutes. This is not small talk. We're getting into, we're getting into, <laughs> you're doing some really good acupuncture here. <laughs> if, if my if my orthodox if my orthodox scientist friends allow me for this pseudo word, you see, <laughs> yes, yes, there's something about phenomenology that I'm I'm struggling with all of these. I mean, I I let me try to explain what I mean by that. And it's I had to sneak in that thought in one sentence because it's it's a short review and it was more about the authors than, than about my own thoughts. But yes, that's one of the qualms I have with phenomenology. And I hope I'll be able to talk to to talk about it with Evan Thompson, whom I'm meeting at the end of this month in San Francisco in a conference we're, we're having about the work of, of Ian McGilchrist. So that's what happens with phenomenology. You say, back to experience, suspend judgment, you know, all I can say is what appears to me, and there's the, there are these these techniques, as I was saying, of of stepping back. Great, but then once you've done that, well, how do you go back to science? Meaning, and some phenomenologists, and it's very interesting the, the remark you make about Heidegger coming later, because Heidegger went full full in towards truth, right? And and being and knowing and but Husserl didn't do that, and and so they they took different paths, and I think I, I'm sorry to say I think phenomenology failed and yet is absolutely necessary, and so there's this feeling that once you're a phenomenologist you you don't want to engage into metaphysics, because that's too much of an abstraction. It seems like you're losing ground, and you always want to be grounded in your experience and also. How do you make progress as a scientist? Because as a scientist, ultimately, you need to make objective measurements. You need to write math. And so there is this weird feeling after you've done, after you, you've recognized your blind spots. Still, you need to continue seeing and doing your work. And, and I think that's what's, and it's actually happening in consciousness studies today. For instance, integrated information theory, which the authors critique, and that's fine. Uh, it's, a, it's a theory that starts from a phenomenological point of view. It says, well, how does experience look like? What are the axioms? What are kind of self-evident truths? This can be disputed, but self-evident yes. truths about my own experience. And on top of this, they start building the mathematical framework and then they go to make experimental predictions and so on. But you see at some point, the phenomenology is suspended and then you go you go on with metaphysical mathematics right there are other phenomenological approaches going on in in, in the neurosciences and, and so well that's what i mean once you become a phenomenologist and I, I sometimes have this impression navigating the waters of science and philosophy that when you press ph philosophers on, on on something they say well that's a matter of the sciences mm -hmm. and when you press the scientists on something they say well we leave that to philosophers, right? So, so it's like where, where the, the waters of a river merge with those of the sea. You're not really sure where you where you are, if it's salt salt water or or not. Well, it's work in progress. And, and they're, of course, really knowledgeable people. Um, for instance, my really my favorite one is Michel Bitbol, a French phenomenologist. He's absolutely amazing. And he's my go-to person to, to discuss these existential doubts I have. And... And it's, anyways, the, despite my critics critics of phenomenology, it's always it's always necessary to go back to what exp experience discloses to us. Although I'd like to to take flights like Alfred North Whitehead with his hardcore philo process philosophical views, or other authors that I also was very happy to sneak in in to the science readers, like not only Whitehead but Bergson and Henri Bergson. And, and and Canguilhem and Jonas, who are great thinkers that, that students, I would say, will never hear about. And so the, I think these guys got it right to the degree that one can get it right. And and you can sense when you when you read them, they are they are grasping reality. It seems they're grasping something about truth or about reality directly. They sound like poets sometimes, or like 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 yogis, 
but then but they then turn out to be philosophers or scientists. So this is the kind of future scientist I, I tend to imagine. Somebody knowledgeable with, you know, data analysis and mathematics and, and all the rest, but but aiming for this direct experience and being able to pull something down as a poet can do. That's a long answer. <laughs> It was a beautiful answer. And we have a question from a viewer here whose YouTube name is BC Clarity Carlton Martin, uh, who asked you, Alex, are you a mystic? Huh. I don't think so. I'm a wannabe mystic. I'm a wannabe. <laughs> I am not. <laughs> I, you know, when I meditate, I fall asleep. I mean, I'm terrible at this. I wish I was better. Um, but I have, but I do, I mean, I'm joking. I'm not, of course, but I have this aspiration. I do have it. And I've been in India a few times, particularly to Auroville in, in Pondicherry and the Sri Aurobindo ashram. Mm -hmm. And that touched me profoundly. And I was in that room where Sri Aurobindo spent decades writing and doing other incredible things. And I could sense something in the air of that room that was very palpable. And, and so since then, he and the mother, who was his spiritual partner, are always with me. And so in that sense, well, that's, that's as much as a mystic I claim myself to be. Someone who, being born in Barcelona, in the West, and being trained as a physicist, has this sense of something really deep um, that's unfathomable, but uh, probably ex not only exper experienceable, but again, this download. They spoke, Shirobindo and the mother spoke not only about the the spirit, you know, the, the spirit going up, like like what seems to be sometimes the game in Buddhism or in other tradition, which is well, like let's just let's just shoot shoot upwards. But they spoke about the spiritualization of matter, right? And that's that's really powerful. The idea. And again, not only the idea, because it's not an academic thought, it's the realization that, yeah, that the divine wishes to come back and, and enjoy matter. And I think that's, in a way, what mystics mystics do. But we, I mean, we can be mystics perhaps a few minutes a day. We can be different things, you know? Mm -hmm. I also wear a lot of masks, like the Wizard of Oz, so... Sometimes, perhaps I'm, I'm I'm trying to wear that mask. Yeah, it's it's a great question, uh, and some people may translate it differently. By the way, uh, I pay a lot of, of attention to words, as you know. And well, is a mystic a spirit a spiritual person? Is a spiritual person a religious person? Is somebody who does mindfulness, which is now sanctioned and allowed, a spiritual or a religious person? These are not the same thing but they, they bring kind of a similar flavor of ah, kind of transcendence, but also staying here, mm -hmm. something imminent and also something transcendent. I mean, these are hard topics. <laughs> yeah, I like what you say, Alex, about the spiritualization of matter. And it makes me think about how your profession of being a neuroscientist that perhaps do you think it's possible that neuroscience is the interface or can be an interface of that spiritualization of matter. Well, that's a tall order, a tall order. But I have this piece because with with Bernard Carr, we we met at the Paris Center, and then we had a an, an online session together, and then we wrote this piece in in a, as a dialogue form, and we were speaking about the sacred brain, and and you know he has these theories of consciousness in space, more than one and two and three dimensions, and. It's called brains, B-R-A-N-E-S. And I was talking about brains. There's no doubt that, that something's going on in the brain that's pretty spectacular, right? And if we go back to William James, as I always like doing, every time I speak about this, I, I have to mention that, right? 99.9% .9 of my colleagues, and also perhaps the lay people, when they're indoctrinated with metaphysics presented um, as if it was pure science, they believe that the brain produces consciousness. So it's not really an interface. It's more like, like a, 
uh, an engine that by its workings produces steam and that steam happens to be phenomenal awareness. You know, and here we we should see big blind spot, blind spot alert, blind spot alert. That's a big blind spot because you're not realizing that it's via your own experience that you're talking about the brain. And then you're claiming that the brain is it's just outputting as a side product experience. So you see, it's like you're, you're cutting your own feet in, in that maneuver. But anyways, <laughs> but, but back to back to your question about the interface, you can think that the brain is productive. Or you can think that you can bet on perhaps that the brain is permissive. And here we could qualify, we could say permissive or so the brain permits consciousness or filters it and mm -hmm. so on. And so that's more the idea of an interface, right? Mm -hmm. The brain is interfacing, interfacing with that which we call mind. It's receiving it, it's permitting it. And by the way, this can be put into the context of some data that are at the edges, as I like to say, the edges of consciousness, right? Like psychedelic research or near-death experiences, even psychical research too. And in that frame, the picture fits better than in the other frame. I wouldn't claim, I'm 100% convinced that that's what the brain is, but it's really good to open this, this other possibility of, of the brain being more like an interface. But then there are other questions that come. So if it's an interface, well, an interface, how is it doing it? And are we still trapped in kind of the Cartesian dualism of, of a piece of matter somewhat, somehow, mm, you know, interfacing with mind? And, and, and so that's where we need to go back to the isms again and, you know, squeeze all the isms as if they were oranges to see what they can produce and then not forget our blind spot. You know, a friend the other day described me as a, as a juggler. And, and I think, it, and I think it's a good, it's another good visual visual image, right? So we need to juggle with all of this, with our more intimate experiences, with our pref preferred abstractions, with what the data says, with what other people tell us, and and kind of hope that the whole thing can just be in the air and not fall. Well, and there's the whole central nervous system, right? So it's not just the brain. There's a spinal cord, and also we have a heart, and there's also. Oh, yeah neuronal tissue in the heart as well so there's and if you come from it also from that the the body is an instrument that you know like an acupuncture there's these meridians and acupoints where some might say that this is where the energy or consciousness may come in and out of the body people are familiar with those with some of the main chakras that might align some say align with the spinal cord or with the glands as well you're right. You're right. So we can start with the most orthodox, safe position and say, must be the, the human cortex. And they say, well, what about the rest of the brain? And what about the nervous system? And what about other organs? And the brain has all, sorry, the heart has always had a great um, mystical, esoteric significance. Uh, and not only that, there's great work, for instance, from the HeartMath Institute, where they see all these um, electromagnetic fields that the brain produces and how people can get into more coherent states and what that does to their own psychology, if you wish. So sure, the brain. And now we're the, we are discovering, right, that rediscovering the wheel that actually the gut also talks to the brain. So it's like, well, there are three, there are three elements here. Um, in, in close dialogue and, and, and co-dependence, right? And then again, the phenomenologists, most phenomenologists tend to come from this branch called an activism. So they make a lot of emphasis about the entire body. And it's very fascinating to think about what's a body. Uh, Henry Bergson says that the body is a very particular image that I have, right? Of of the world, because it's it's it, it's able to perceive from the outside, but also from the inside. So here we have perception and affect. And some very notable, notorious neuroscientists have emphasized that, like Antonio Damasio, right? The, the crucial importance of, of the, the, the very neurons dialoguing with one's body and how, in his view, this is a necessary condition for, for consciousness. And we could go beyond that, actually. And, and in some of and some talks I've given about the extended mind, because it's a very useful way to talk about all of that, is, well, let's rewind 400 years. We made this split, mind and matter, and now we're trying to put it together. One way, borrowing that phrase from Santayana, is to spread, um, to spread it like butter 
over breath. So we can start spreading the mind, as I was just saying, okay, from the cortex to the brain, to the nervous system, to other organs, to the entire skin. Do we stop there or not? Well, as your viewers may know, we don't. <laughs> we say beyond the body and we can sense things that are not perhaps mediated by impact on our skin and so on. So the question is how much do we want to extend our mind to the world? And what does that do to our notion of the world? Is the world mind-like? And so here it comes an ism, idealism. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe yes, with some qualifications. So so totally. But it's true, the brain, and but the Egyptians knew that. The, the Egyptians knew that. Like there was this papyrus where somebody was hit on the on the head with a rod. And they described, well, it works. He he walks in a funny way, right? So so there's no doubt. Another metaphor that I like to use is like something hanging, also borrowed from Henry Bergson. There's no doubt that the shape of that cardigan or whatever really depends on, on, on where it's hanging from. Like there's no doubt that the shapes that the mind take um, depend on, on its hanging from the brain. You only need to drink too much alcohol or too, you know, to, or be hit on the head to realize that the shape of the mind has changed. But that's one thing. And another thing is to say that both are the same thing, right? That, that the hunger and, and the cardigan are identical. They're not identical. They depend on each other. So still the brain, long answer. <laughs> long answer that doesn't answer, by the way. I was having, a, let me just have a side note here. I was having one of these live events with our friend from the Iclovi, Iclovi Foundation. And I, I read the comments because they're usually love, lovely. It's not narcissism, believe me. And somebody said, well, they've asked you all these questions and you've talked blah, blah, blah. And you've, you've, not, you've not answered any of them. So <laughs> I, should, I should put this disclaimer. I mean, I'm not here to answer questions as the expert. I think I'm here to just rephrase the questions so that, that we can understand better what's at stake, right? So I haven't answered your question, but of course the brain is very important. And that's why I think that neuroscience today is perhaps in a similar position in terms of opportunities. As, as as modern physics was a hundred years ago, because the big blind, it's not even a blind spot consciousness. It's, it's like we're hitting onto the, 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 the walls of the whole setup we've built to deal about the world as something objective. And so if we're lucky, we will see some big revolution. Some people like to experience that, others like the waters to be more calm, but hopefully this is, this will happen soon. And, and and neuroscience can, but it depends on neuroscientists, can be at the forefront of that revolution. Uh, and yet there's so much work to do because we are shaped so much into this materialistic, reductionistic, mechanistic worldview that, and this is another topic, I know I'm rambling, that by the time you may, even if you have a, look, even if you have a big um, experience, you've so committed your bets on a certain ism or a certain theory or a certain career path that you may not want to undo that. I was talking, let me say one more thing, Amy, sorry. I was talking to Christoph Koch um, last week on one of these events with you at the Paris Center. And I asked him and I praised him. I said, look, um, you've changed your mind enormously. You started with Francis Crick being the epitome of you know, let's forget all philosophy. Let's just get into the brain, measure neurons, and we'll figure it out. But then he became what he calls a romantic, um, what is it? A romantic, um, ah, a romantic materialism? No, a romantic reductionist. And and then he became something that sounds more like a panpsychist. And last week I heard that he was sounding more like a, like an idealist, a la Bernardo Castro. So. It, regardless of what you think about those isms, I said, it's remarkable you change your opinion so much, given how prominent. And I asked him, well, what's the secret? And he said, well, scientists tend to identify themselves with their own work so much that you're not willing to give it up because it feels like you're giving up your own being, right? Yes. Oh, the, the much food for thought, Alex. And... If I may, we have a question here from one of our wonderful volunteers, Elizabeth Lord, who was recently a guest on New Thinking Aloud, talking about her new book, 
Calliope O'Callaghan and the Psy Syndicate, which is a fictional account of people uh, teaching young people with gifts, psychic, spiritual, intuitive gifts to embrace that, to help reach a younger audience. She asks, what event, if any, got you interested in consciousness and neuroscience? All right, these events are really not, not great uh, to sell books if I, if I had written any, because it's not the usual, you know, when I was a little boy, I used to see butterflies and I was wondering how do they work? If only I could open them. And that's not how I became a scientist. I became a scientist because, because I, I enjoyed very much maybe this kind of abstractions. I mean, it's something that has to do with temperament. I mean, it could be trained, but you see, I couldn't be a, uh, couldn't be a marathon runner because that's not how I'm built, but it seems like I'm good at this kind of abstraction. So I studied physics and mathematics because I had a great teacher in high school that paid a lot of attention. And, and so that's what I did it. But then I transitioned into neuroscience really by chance, really by chance. A romantic way of explaining it is because of love. You know, my partner was finishing her PhD. I finished mine. What do I do? Do I go abroad and we stay separated? Does she come with me do i stay i decided to stay i looked for a job and there was a they were they were looking for physicists because we are as i joke the looks technicians because we can write code and all of that so a neuroscience lab embraced me and and it was it, i was lucky that this happened but it, but it was also harsh because here i come with all my you know analytical repertoire and i'm i'm studying all of a sudden fruit flies so that's how i got into neuroscience really a winding or a winding road or a strange road. A friend of mine once told me, Alex, when I look at what you've done, it's like scattered dots in the sky. They don't make any sense. And I say, probably you're right. And then I realized, well, maybe it's more like a constellation, right? Because I wasn't planning on all of those things. Retrospectively, I'm very happy that it happened the way it did, but really there wasn't, there wasn't a big plan. Even, even these themes that we may talk about next, perhaps, you know, the more psychical stuff, the more heretic science I'm doing now. It's something, honestly, that three years ago, I knew nothing about. I knew nothing about. And it's because I had this new death experience. I've talked about it, I think, in the channel that I became interested. You were asking before, Amy, well, what can make the shift? Well, something like this happens. And then you say, wait a minute, what was that? What was that tunnel? And if you're very, if you're very committed into being a card carrying you know, dogmatic skeptic, of course, I'll be, I'll be preaching that that's just a, some sort of visual hallucination that I, that I had. Um, but I think it's something different. So it, it's, I don't have like a narrative, a, a well-carved narrative because things happen to me a little bit by chance. Um, I think I'm a lucky, a, a lucky boy and good things happen to me and I'm, I'm, I'm wide open and I, and I seize the opportunities. And so well, we'll see. We'll see what what's coming next. But but yes, my my path is really strange. I've been changing. I've been, I've been very curious. I I didn't mind just switching to another thing and losing all the credit, all the capital I had accumulated in this small or big, on this particular area. As a friend told me the other day, I'm a, an encyclopedic ignorant. You know, <laughs> that's why I am. I'm proud. We I think we, we need a few of them, maybe not too many. We have a lot of experts. I don't consider myself an expert, but we need some of those people who are willing to put their head like explorers, put, you know, to, to visit very different territories and, and come back and report what they see. I think doing, uh, making a career shift for love is uh, a beautiful thing to do and uh, good things are likely to come from it. We have a question from a viewer named Chuck Peck, who asks if you can explain more about or have you investigated cases of people that have little or no brain matter yet have been able to function within normal parameters? No, I haven't. But there are these famous cases of hydrocephalia, I think they're called, where somebody's perfectly normal, according to our standard of what's to be normal, you know, you can go to work, you can cook, you can talk and so on. And then for some reason they, they have a brain scan and, and then they think there's a glitch in the machine because it's only a thin kind of a thin ham layer of brain and all the rest is essentially water. 
And this has been reported, and I've read those those papers. I haven't studied them myself. And this is yet one more piece of evidence. And evidence is not proof, but it's a piece of evidence pointing towards other ways of conceiving what a brain is. Because, right, can you imagine that if that this phone could work just with <laughs> the thin layer outside, I mean, and do perfectly its job, then we, we should wonder what's the real role of all these circuits that it has inside. Not, not to say that these circuits aren't playing a, a big role, which is a, a filler verb that many biologists say, you know, plays a big role. Seems like you said something important, but it's not really clear what you meant. You know, it means that, well, if, you're, if it's not there, maybe the whole thing c collapses. So back to these cases, yeah, it's fascinating how, how this is going on. It's similar also to, to near-death experiences where, where uh, the doctors could even measure brain activity and the EEG is flat. Although those who want to dispute that will say, well, even if it's flat, there could be still some activity, some little activity going on in some areas of the brain and they're right. But then what I would say is that the burden of proof, this idea of the burden of proof, who then has more explanatory work to do, starts falling on them, right? Because when you have all these really weird cases, these are anomalous cases, but these, these anomalous cases is precisely what we need to look at to discover, to, to maybe to just progress, like to make progress in science. Like we could remain Newtonian forever. We could be happy with how apples fall from trees, right? But... You know, when you when you look at these subtleties, uh, for instance, you know how light bends as it comes close to 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 a planet or a big star and so on. Well, there there's some anomalies there. They pile up, and if we're lucky, then this this brings a new understanding. Which, by the way, and this is also crucial to mention, this new understanding doesn't doesn't refute and throw to the bin everything we've had before. Because some people say, well, Alex, if these things you're talking about are true, then we need to throw all the entire edifice of physics, like demolishing all the edifices. Not really. It's an expansion. You know, when, when Einstein came along, Newton's apples continued to fall in the same way. But we <laughs> learned something more about the universe, right? So let's pay attention to these cases, like people who barely have a brain and they're pretty normal. What is that? Well, what do you think's going on there? Ooh, yeah. All right. Okay. Two things could be happening that are, you know, very speculative. One is, I still think the brain is important. So maybe even with those, when should, and that's really hard to study, the structure of those thin brain layers, maybe that's enough to filter, if we like to think of it, to filter or receive or permit enough mind, right? Enough mind to be, be, behave as normal. That's very speculative, but it could be. could be that you don't need the whole thing. Another idea is some people speak about the water that's in those brains. Say, well, you just say it's water as if it was, you know, whatever. <laughs> but some people speak about very particular properties that water has. And, and we take it for granted. Maybe it's another blind spot. Like all, all, all living organisms, we're made of water. Water seems to be very important. Maybe water is not just boring H2O. Maybe water is doing other things. So a crazy speculation would be, well, maybe water can do some of that work, right? Um, other <laughs> crazy hypotheses could be, well, maybe it's outsourced to the heart, right? Uh, they will hang me here, my neuroscience colleagues, for just for just suggesting that. But in the same way, let's let's think about this. In the same way that it's known that some brain regions, when 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 you know when you have a stroke or when you have some some lesion or something like that, can other other brain regions can compensate? Well, maybe other parts of our body can compensate. Um, it's it's a possibility. It's a big question mark, and that's precisely why we should look more into that direction as opposed to saying, well, whatever, two or three cases, let's continue digging here and, and just self-gratifying ourselves with, with our ism that we've been carrying <laughs> carrying over for the last 400 years. Maybe there's something new to see. As, as Richard Feynman said, we should look in those areas that would allow us to refute ourselves as fast as possible. 
And I believe many, many scientists are precisely doing the opposite, you know, not trying to refute themselves as fast as possible, but just be, be chill in, in, in the little condominium we build and, and well, being curious, I think it's the opposite. It's willing to be eager, not just willing, eager to be surprised and, and change your, your opinion about things. And the more fundamental thing, but maybe that's also something that's temperamental, that different people live it differently, you know? Like big surprise, like when information theory speaks about, or predictive coding speaks about how something you don't expect causes this big surprise because it, it updates your model of the world in a very dramatic way. Maybe some people are big update junkies, you know, and they want paradigms to fall and so on. I'm in this category, but I'm maybe because I'm getting old, uh, older, I'm becoming more empathic with maybe other people. Really, they just want to have an easy life, an easy life as an academic, and they don't want paradigm changes. They don't want earthquakes. They they don't want big updates of their priors. They just want to do the little the little work and do it forever, right? <laughs> so different. It's different different ways of being and maybe to challenge how are we going to coin habit science without you know in self inhibiting each other's roles here mm -hmm. we have another wonderful volunteer pablo who is asking what are the most important topics about consciousness being researched today and i would also add in what are you focused on alex what are you finding is really stimulating you or you're passionate about yeah right so because i've come out of the closet i'll just come out of the closet virtually naked here and 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 say i'm i'm very interested in three aspects three heretical aspects of my upbringing as a neuroscientist because i spent a lot of time studying perception in fruit flies <laughs> action in fruit flies and worms so basically the usual thing, which is pretty cool, how do we perceive, receive sensory stimulation? How do we process it? When I say we, I mean, in that case, the, the humble maggot, but, but animals, how animals, how organisms um, perceive, process, and act, and so on. I mean, this is a fascinating topic. Okay, so now what about the question if this perception ne must necessarily be mediated by by sensory signals. In other words, sure, can you have a perception that doesn't come through the five senses as, we, as we've told, right? This is also called ESP and you have tons of conversations in this channel about that. So I'm really interested in that as a possibility. And because I'm a Bergsonian and a Whiteheadian at heart, reading them, I have a theoretical frame upon which I can at least entertain, this is a key word, not necessarily endorse and say for sure, I can entertain the possibility. It's it's a theoretically possible for me to imagine that you could receive influences without necessarily having to do with little molecules just hitting the, the surface of your, your sensory receptors being the eyes or sense of smell. So that's the first leg of the heretical stool. The second one is action. Right, I studied many years how animals do things, and so the heretical question in here is: Can was not just receive influences, but produce influences in the world without? And note here the the, the challenge is always saying we we do this without that. So can we receive without sensory systems, and can we produce without motor systems? And I'm not saying some anything different than what's called PK in the literature, right? The ability to affect that's that's even harder to conceive that that receiving so that's the other the other aspect i'm interested in for instance the work uh, of the pearl lab and helmut smith before and roger nelson afterwards about random event generators and and influences on that and then the third one is survival research because i have my little nde <laughs> I wonder, and so this is another thing that if you if you if you're upbringing as a physicist slash biologist neuroscientist, well, as I always ask, what happens with the mind when the brain dies? Well, the mind dies. That's what you say if you're a materialist. But why? If that's not the only possibility. So these are the three topics I'm interested: ESP, PK, and survival, which in a way cover 
like the three main co chords, if that was a song, the three main chords of the psychical research melody. <laughs> But let me just say, but but I'm really learning. I'm 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 catching up. I'm reading everything I can. I don't I don't wish to reinvent the wheel. I don't think that here the clever physicist will will solve it. I mean, there's so much that has been done for so long, uh, and it's good stuff. Um, contrary to what many of these you know armchair bloggers uh, um, say, there's a lot that has been done, and one needs to learn it. And by the way, Jeff, and this will resonate with you. One so far needs to be self-taught about these things because there's no place one can that I know one can be properly trained in these matters. And so I'm lucky enough to know Jeff and, and also be embraced in a community of really knowledgeable people. So I am blessed by that and I absorb as much as I can. But I think we need we need a, a, a also a, maybe not institutional, but some sort of educational system where beyond books and stories and so on, we can be formally trained because look, if you want to be anything, at least well in life, but also in academia, if you want in everything in life, if you want to make good meals, you need to be go to, to a school where they train teach you how to cook. Maybe there's one incredibly gifted kid who, you know, at the age of four is already cooking like, like a chef. But no, people need to go and be trained. The same with physics, you need many years. Um, well, in psychical research or consciousness research. We need this kind of training, and we we are we starve of it. And I, so hopefully, we'll have news in the future about places where where this can take place in in a more systematic way. Well, you've given me an opening to mention that we are uh, on the verge of submitting a proposal to set up uh, graduate programs in parapsychology, the way I did it through an individual interdisciplinary major uh, at the California Institute of uh, Human Science. I just heard uh, this morning the new president of that organization, Jeffrey Martin, uh, took uh, over the office yeah, uh, just two days ago on March 1st. And uh, he and I have been in discussion now for weeks. And uh, it looks like uh, very soon New Thinking Aloud will be making a number of announcements. And as, as a matter of fact, I guess it would be fair to say that uh, we will be including uh, your resume, Alex, in, in the uh, list of potential instructors who, who will be part of that program. Well, that's great news for the big project when it comes to me. I'm 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 a student as well, but this is fantastic, Jeff. This is fantastic because again, if we want to do things well, we need good training, uh, systematic training, uh, create a culture where where that it's nurtured, right? I mean, there are all these, I know I use a lot of images and some people also critique me for that but I'm just I just see them like there are all these beautiful flowers here and there you know and we know all of these people they're our friends our colleagues right and one wonders how did they survive how did they thrive even thrive now if we can have a little garden you know like uh, the new new Atlantis a la Francis Bacon today um and bear in mind that retrospectively people will say oh sure whatever but it's not that obvious. And and even the history of physics teaches that. Like, um, can you imagine what these guys who were developing quantum physics were feeling? They were they should be totally puzzled, bewildered by where they were studying, and and the, the, the whole thing needed to be then organized and pruned and clean and varnished and taught. And still then we're we we have all these um mysteries on the table, right? So I'm really happy if something like that can happen. Um, and some people may not like to call it parapsychology. Well, call it what you wish. Call it psychical research. No, I'm too clean for that. All right, call it anomalous cognition. Well, no, I'm not a I'm not a psychologist. Well, call it new. Call it consciousness research. You know, and um, let's not get too stuck up with words. But maybe something where we can bring together people because we need we will need engineers and physicists and psychologists and mystics probably. Right and and talented people. That's another big topic we could discuss, by the way, because this is like studying. Um, if you were studying physical performance, you don't want to randomly sample from the street and ask people to run a hundred meters in less than ten seconds, right? 
So there's also something that involves, this is beautiful, that involves the so-called lay people. I don't know, lay people, not just as, as some group that we just bottom up, tell them our results, but they're engaged, they're participants. They're in a way core core researchers, if you wish, in, in this kind of in this kind of investigations of of the edges of the human mind because they can do it. Yeah. I just want to say, Jeff, that I am very happy for you with your career because I know going all the way back to maybe it was even your first in presence or the very beginning of your in presence monologues, you have described yourself as feeling very lonely of having the only doctoral degree that has parapsychology on it. And so I applaud you and Alex and your other colleagues who have really come together and people uh, at the California Institute of Human Sciences for creating this, because not only is it wonderful for people who professionally want to go into this, but these are very common occurrences that people experience in even in the mental health profession, people can frequently become mislabeled or diagnosed with something and become stigmatized because of their uh, probably natural gifts that some ind indigenous cultures would recognize as maybe being even a shamanic route or just simply part of being human. Absolutely. And, and we're at the top of the hour almost. We should let our viewers know we'll be continuing the live stream for another half hour till we get to the bottom of the hour. Uh, here's a question from a viewer whose YouTube name is Control Alt Escape. <laughs> and uh, the, the question is, the idea of a holographic or simulated universe is becoming enmeshed in the public consciousness, does this have any significance or congruence with the ideas we're discussing here today? Great question. Um, holographic and simulated form, I would, say, I would separate those two and address them first. Let's talk about holographic. The, the, the idea, not just the idea, the, an actual hologram is this technological trick by which you can have a system that produces an image. And if you, in a way, if you would split in parts or, or coarse grain its resolution and you shine light on, on it again, it would still contain and be able to reproduce that image. So the, the, the hologram is a technological achievement that, that enacts this lovely phrase that in a way, perhaps the whole can be contained in each of the parts. That's what a hologram does. Um, and so th that's very appealing because this is a way of thinking about non-locality in space and time. Um, it's not directly the same, but for instance, the Carl Pryram, with, with whom probably you've had the conversation, Jeff, because you've had conversations with everyone that really matters in, in, in this long journey. So he spoke about the holographic brain and so it was a way to see, well, because we're, that was another, it came from another problem. It came from the problem of where are memories located, right? Where do we find memories? And then previous people like, like, like Carl Lashley and others um, were trying to, they, similar to that question about the, the, the brain filled with water, they, they, will, they, they were lesioning rodents in different parts of the brain and the memories weren't, weren't going away. So where are they stored? And, and so Priram thought, well, Maybe we can invoke this idea of the hologram and in a way every part will be containing the whole and that could be made precise. So I like the idea of a holographic brain and maybe a holographic universe because it, it forces us to think beyond um, beyond things always being locally mediated. And so this, this allows us to think about ESP, as we were saying before, and other matters. When it comes to the simulated universe, you see, Galileo said that mathematics is the language in which we, we, we speak and, and nature replies. And, and lately, I'm a bit, it's, there's a bit of an overdose of these computationalist metaphors because we're living in the age of AI taking off. And so there's some very respectable people like, like, like Stephen Wolfram and, and, and others who go as far as say, well, 
the universe is not really made of matter. What it is is a computation. And then so all these guys that will want to sell us, you know, goggles so that we don't <laughs> pay attention to the actual physical world, they love that. And it's very promoted, the idea that everything is a simulation. Well, you need to unpack it. Maybe if you go to the East and you talk to the Indians the, and so on, they'll say, they'll speak about Maya and they mean it in a very particular sense. Here, it's more like in the West, it's more like a big computer game. Come on, I think I think we have other metaphors, but the, the, there's probably a kernel of truth in it. But I don't want to give up, and maybe that's my bias. I don't want to give up the idea that I think when I'm talking to you, even though you're in a screen or when I'm putting my girls to, to bed, they are there and they are real and I have direct contact with them. You know, this idea of we live in the matrix. Well, then, then who's running the simulation? And so maybe there's an infinite regress. But anyways, there are fascinating ideas about not just what's the brain, but what's the universe. Um, uh, the, again, the blind spot they with, with, with which we started. If we're just fascinated by the idea that everything is a simulation, we're just giving giving up direct experience for some cherry pick abstraction that's fashionable. And and if we forget that, we, we're screwed. I think we're screwed. Well, there's that's a pretty direct comment on the simulation model. <laughs> so we're screwed. <laughs> well, well, that's another thing. Pick your ism, pick your data, pick whatever. Now, derive, derive ethical implications. That's also important. You know, I have a really good friend who's a who's a who's an author. He's a philosopher, and he once told me that that when he goes to he meets poets and people from from the Spanish literary world and so on and that it's not only the, the science and the metaphysics it's the ethics and the aesthetics and he says well most scientists bring like a really poor ethics with them they don't notice and also a really ugly aesthetics and we should think about those like okay what does a, a simulated universe mean what does that do to love what does that do to our sense of the sacred what does that do, you know, to all of those things that we really care about as mm. implications, as ethical and aesthetic, aesthetical implications? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it makes them look more ugly. And, and, then, and then the Richard Dawkins of the world will say, and we don't care what you think uh, re reality is or how you feel about it. This is what science says. Well, no, sorry. I mean, there's a lot to unpack here. It matters. It matters back to experience. It matters how how it makes us feel, and it matters what consequences this has. And it has consequences that lead to the destruction of the world. Then, from a pragmatist pragmatist point of view, this is not a good theory because it, it destroys what we cherish the most. <laughs> Alex, are you also saying or suggesting that if we don't take these experiences, whatever they are, all of our experiences, as seriously or as real that we somehow are wanting to be off the hook for consequences or for our one might even say purpose for being here on yes, this planet yes, yes. it's a self-inflicting numbness right it's like we we numb ourselves and, and i can see reasons why we would want to do this because sometimes life is hard to bear but if we don't take, and I don't mean only academically, I mean existentially, if we don't take these things, these experiences, and, and here people are very sneaky and clever. I mean, I recall this recent um, debate between Anil Seth and Tanya Lerman and Rupert Sheldrake a few months ago. And, you know, Seth was saying, this famous neuroscientist was saying, well, yeah, we should take these, these experiences for what they are. But at the end of the day, we'll really reduce them to brain mechanisms and so on. So again, blind spot again. And and you, a few minutes ago, Emmy mentioned also psychiatry. I mean, there's a lot of human suffering. This is not just like, all right, let's read some books and be clever about it. There's a lot of human suffering. Uh, and I'm not saying that there's not such thing as, as mental disease. Probably there is, but, but, but there, it's a spectrum. And maybe some people are not mad. They're just, they, they just have... A wider, a wider awareness of 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 what's going on, and well, it's it's unfortunate we we just categorize them as such. And 
the moment I start talking about those things, people tell me their stories and, and they are fascinating. And when they find a place, when they find a place for them, it's, this is unfortunate, by the way, because they go, they've been trained to go and ask the expert to validate, to validate what they sense in their heart. It's like, this is happening to me. I'll go and ask the expert. And sure, we need experts. Like when something breaks in my house, I need to call the expert that can come and fix it. I'm not against experts, but but it's it's unfortunate that we we submit our, our most intimate experiences to the to the abstractions of other people where what we should be is find them a home and validate them and then see what they mean. And yes. This is very moving, actually. This is does this doesn't sound like the next theory of consciousness. This sounds like humanism, a hundred percent, like how to be proper humanists in, in nowadays world. Right, and to explore that person's own experience and to find out maybe even what it means to them as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Like the other day I arrived home and my, my, my older daughter was, was angry, was crying, crying and so on. But I could, I couldn't, I think I knew analytically what was going on, but all I had to do was to try to approach her, hope that she can get close to me at some point, you know, she would, so that she can, you know, shout and cry and then tell me and like just embracing. It wasn't, it wasn't a problem to solve. It was just mm -hmm. being there, accompanying that and that's very powerful. Yeah. It's not about understanding what's going on. Is well, can you participate in it? Yeah. There's a question from a viewer named Christopher who asks, where would you say neurodivergent individuals, given their often unique neurobiology, metamagical thinkers belong in current parapsychology? Where do those people belong? This is their question. So however mm. you interpret that question, I think okay. they're wanting, oh, perhaps yes. trying to just get a viewpoint on, you know, neurodivergent is a popular term at the moment that really yes. is, um, well, my understanding of it is that it shows that we all have our own neurobiology. Well, you're the neuroscientist. Yes. How do well, you understand okay. neurodivergency? Why don't you tell us yourself? Okay, let me let me answer it in a way that probably it's not what the, the person who asked this is expecting, but do we really need to put the prefix neuro to speak about neurodivergent? You see, neuromarketing, neurosacred, <laughs> neuro orange juice. Sure. <laughs> I mean, yes, if you see what I mean, let me, let me go to a bigger, a bigger problem here, something that's a stake. Well, maybe it's necessary. I want to validate it. Because because maybe, as I was saying a few minutes ago, you need to go to the expert, in this case, the neuro expert, and say, right, right, that we all have different brains, and that, okay, and can that, to some to some extent, um, you know, calm me down in understanding that I am different, but am I different because my brain is different? I mean, is this, is this what will make me rest in peace? You know, it's like, my brain made me do it. So yes, we're all different. We We, we know we're different. And certainly, um, you can find correlates or, or neural substrates that that confirm that intuition. Um, I think the real diversity, and this is very popular also, especially in the United States, by the way, because from from Europe, well, it has arrived, but these these battles between those who who emphasize diversity and you know all that equity, equality, and so on, we're all different, and we're all the same in different ways, and. That has to do also with the word anomalous. What's something anomalous? An anomalous experience, an anomalous person, an anomalous theory, an anomalous piece of data. I love that, you know? This is an anomalous piece of data. Well, it's data. It's data or it isn't. It is, but it's anomalous. Well, it doesn't fit in a frame. So the problem here is not the anomalous person, the anomalous theory, or the anomalous data. The problem here is the frame, our habits, is the, the frame we're used to spending time with. So if, if all this neurodiversion talk can help us revise our frames, I think it's, it's, it's a healthy, it's a healthy move. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's chatting in Christopher is and suggesting that it's like a quirk having a quirk, or he says, of course, like you were, uh, I think also saying it's on a spectrum 
And of course we have a lot of similarities, but you know, where, where does it become uh, divergent from the norm? You know, cause one could say we're all neurodivergent on a certain level, but specifically from with parapsychology, I think he's just curious, how does this, how does this fit in with parapsychology? I, I'm not, I don't know much about it, but for instance, I've had conversations with psychiatrists mm -hmm. about normality, because I'm curious about everything. And um, well, because for instance, for instance, uh, let me make a disclaimer here or a confession. I sometimes hear voices. I do. Probably it's my thoughts. Sometimes I hear like good ideas. I mean, that's what a scientist, I mean, if you were a scientist, we are desperate to receive a good idea. Well, this may manifest like a voice, right? And I would ask my, because I had some close colleagues who are psychiatrists, which, to whom I could ask them over, over a coffee. So do you think this is something that should be treated? And then they said, well, as long as you have a functional life. So you see how contingent all of this is about our habits as a society, you know? If you can operate again normally, well, that's perfectly fine. So from their expert point of view, that wouldn't be a condition, right? Now, if that creates problems in your normal functioning with society, it's a very complex topic. It's whose fault? Is it society for not being different? It's you. And, and it's indeed a spectrum that can become really problematic. And, and people have real, real trouble. So, you know, I'm... From 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 people who really I would say mentally, probably mentally ill, and it's it's terrible to s simply people who have lots of intuitions, premonitions, visions, and they don't know what to do with them, and they can't talk to people about them because they'll think they're mad, and then they may become more mad because they don't know what to do with it. So maybe a way to just get out of this mess I'm getting here is in Spain we had a TV program in the '90s that was called Let's Talk About Sex. You know, we came from a dict dictatorship. I was very young. I was 10 years old, but but it, it caused a big spur. Uh, everybody was watching it because suddenly on TV and maybe in our, in our house, people could talk about sex and just talking about it, you know, opening the windows and letting the air get fresh and out, we, we could progress in something that's been kept and rarefied for many years. So yeah. it's... Yeah, really, as, as as some of my lovely critics would say, I'm rambling and I'm not answering. I don't know, but it, that's all I can say. Yeah, well, I think you made a really valid point or helping raise awareness, which is a lot of what we do on New Thinking Aloud, about hearing voices, which one could say is also on a spectrum. I interviewed a psychiatrist, rest in peace, Dr. Manuel Matis out of Canada, and he had a 40-year career, very prestigious psychiatrist in Canada. And he wrote a book, I believe it was called Beyond uh, the Borders of Normal. And because he found in his career that many of his patients would hear voices and they weren't necessarily detrimental. In fact, there's even research that it's that a lot of the population hears voices. And so to your point, it's, you know, what are those voices saying? And how does one have a relationship with that or their images that they experience and so forth? Yes, yes. There's another uh, question from Christopher that has me intrigued because it seems as if uh, in the uh, community of uh, postmodern thinking, uh, people who think about the singularity, there's this idea that humans are going to be merging with uh, computers, basically, with, with digital technology. And uh, Elon Musk has this company, Neuralink. They're already developing models for interfacing the brain with uh, electronics. Um, how do you feel about that, Alex? Yeah. There's an evolutionary arc going on and perhaps that has an intelligence of its own you know if i can go high wire again on some thoughts so maybe evolution knows what it's doing oh what are you saying evolution is blind and so on yeah whatever maybe evolution knows what it's doing but i'm not i'm not convinced that transhumanism is the better route it's certainly a route probably transcendence Transcendence is another route that we can choose. 
So we can bet it all in the machines. We can be these monkeys who created these cool gadgets. And now we say, well, how can we continue our, our path towards becoming divine? Well, these gadgets will do it for us. And if we're lucky, we'll be a part of it. And maybe we can hybridize. And maybe at some point they will toss us because they don't need us. This, this is all the, the talk about what AI may do. And it, probably it's an option, right? There's another one that's always been there for millennia, right? Which is the, the, the more spiritual path, if you wish. And it's to work on your inner being. And, you know, when I was talking about divinization of matter, so to receive these gifts, these divine gifts, align your will and receive these gifts. And that's the way to make evolutionary progress. I think we have both on the table. It's more, it's, it's louder and stronger, the, the techno the techno route, perhaps both could be combined, um, merged like thesis, antithesis, and maybe synthesis. Maybe not. You know, sometimes I think, and this is a crazy, a crazy thought to think, but maybe we speciate. You know this idea? <laughs> That's happened forever in life on Earth. Like there's one species and it cares about some things, and the other just picks another. You know, one some want to get out of the water. Come on, don't do that. You'll you'll kill yourself, and others remain. And two species are formed, or maybe one remains and the other, a new species is formed. Maybe that's the future of humanity, speciation. It sounds a bit, sounds rather democratic. If you want to be a transhumanist, all right, just buy into all of that, implant yourself. Maybe you survive. I'm I'm not against Elon Musk. Some people, some people are really harsh on, on him. You know, what if it, what if we have this asteroid coming, destroying the earth and, and he just figured out how to go to Mars? Maybe that's our only way of, of of just saving a bit of humanity. But at the same time, given all we've been discussing today, it's a big blind spot to bet our future on technology. And, and so I would lean more towards the second option, transcendence. Um, yeah, that, that's a trans prefix that I prefer to transhumanism. Because transhumanism is like giving up, giving up humanity. It's like giving up yeah, giving giving yourself up as a species for your own to glorified toy, which is technology. Ah, it doesn't sound like a good deal, but maybe I'm wrong and they make it to Mars and, and we're all here, you know, having meditations and the asteroid comes and it kills us all. Well, <laughs> could be. <laughs> yeah, I think that generally speaking, uh, here on New Thinking Aloud, we're very sympathetic to uh, transcendence over transhumanism. Mm -hmm. I would say so. Well, we have about 10 minutes left and Alex, you've given us a lot to consider. And there's a follow-up question here from Pablo, the volunteer, who asks, are you familiar with the glitch in the matrix stories, a kind of continuity error, error, error excuse me, a continuity error in reality where people's perception does not agree with reality? Even Bigelow has one related to a slice of an apple. What's your opinion about them, if any? Hmm. Glitches are, I don't know how much we want to stretch the metaphor or the idea of a glitch, but the 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 errors, uh, in the errors lies new, lie new solutions, right? Like if you... If you're analyzing data, let me be here conservative or answer it in an easy way. If you're analyzing data and you have all these dots on a plot and they all align perfectly on a straight line and there's one that's down there, right? Well, one option is say, whatever, you know, that's just must be something about the equipment. It's an error. And perhaps that there's a methodology that allows you to say that. Or maybe you could even check it and realize, oh yes, look, that day there was, an, there was a flaw in how we did it. So I can explain it away. I can just discard this piece of data, right? And I'm so happy with my straight line. And this explains all my data. And I made some progress. But like the movie Minority Report, for instance, right? But 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 errors, if they're not stupid errors, are like the little doors, like Alice in Wonderland. These are the little doors that if you open them and you're able to go through them, they just bring you to the new understanding, right? So that's how I would interpret glitches. Um, in the matrix, if you want to say, and I love how they, you know, the movie with the cat passing by twice, 
deja vu, for instance, right? What's deja vu? Um, and some people may say, well, it's just something wrong going in your brain. And other people say, no, 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 no. This is the guy running the simulation that made a mistake. And errors are are very juicy places to to spend time because when things don't match, uh, it's where you can find other ideas. It's a source of creativity. So uh, as as scientists, and I would say as, as like people too, I mean, we, we shouldn't be obsessed with errors because otherwise you, we cannot function normally, right? That would bring some sort of paranoia, right? Like this doesn't make sense and this doesn't make sense. You cannot live like that. But it's good, like a good detective story. You must look for the pieces that don't fit. This is what attention needs to be directed to. So I'm all for glitches. Well put, Alex. Um, we're running uh, close to uh, where we're going to end. And I do want to let our viewers know that we uh, publish a weekly newsletter for our uh, New Thinking Aloud avid uh, viewers. You can sign up for free at the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website. We publish a quarterly magazine beautifully laid out. It's also available for free and can be downloaded from the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website, which is newthinkingaloud.org. And uh, we've also launched a you know, book imprint with uh, White Crow Books. Our first book uh, was out last year, which is called uh, Is There Life After Death? And I can tell you that we have two new books which will be released in the coming weeks. One will be a, a tribute to Russell Targ, who is about to turn 90 years old next month. And the other is a book about UFOs. So uh, stay tuned for more information about those books as as well. Alex, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave with our viewers uh, as we close our interview today? That it's good we talk about this. Um, and we feel more and more relaxed and, and normal just discussing these topics. And I, I thank you for having hosted this space for decades, Jeff. I... I've heard, I, I I heard Terence McKenna for the first time talking to you, and I, and I never thought I would be in conversation with you once or twice or three times or more. So it, it's I want to end with just thanking you for decades of holding a space for when the moment is ripe for new things to come back with force, and hopefully that time has arrived. I hope so as well. Emmy, I wonder if you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with our viewers. Oh, I want to share what a pleasure it is to be with both of you, Jeff and Alex, and all of the listeners and viewers here today. And for one who has studied neurobiology as an occupational therapist and has worked with people for, with mental health conditions, which are just might be very normal part of their human experience. And those who have also suffered neurological conditions such as strokes, brain injuries, and so forth. I just want to thank you, Alex, for your contributions to neuroscience and for having such an open mind and heart and for wading into these areas that really can expand our understanding of ourselves and each other so that we can be kinder to ourselves and each other more and more. So thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you, Well, we, uh, we still have a couple of minutes and we have many, many questions. I know it's hard to answer some of these deep questions, uh, but here's one last question from a viewer named Mark Vernon, who wants to know, Alex, if you think that consciousness experts like Dante or Teresa of Avila or William Blake can inform consciousness studies today. Uh, hello, Mark. Mark is a good friend. Something I admire for his humanistic work, of course. Totally, totally. These were the pioneers. Um, 
saint, um, true um, humanists and poets, their their intuitions remain um, true. I would say they remain true. Now, with our neuroscientific games, I think the goal here is to uncover again those truth truths with the tools we have. But in a way, we know when we connect to those, we know they are true. Uh, and I think I once wrote somewhere that there's more there's more insight about human condition in a Dostoevsky novel than in in a hundred treat treaties a uh, treatise on, on on neuroscience right so but that doesn't exclude the work we're doing so yes total respect in a time where uh, everything needs to sound like hard sciences or it's second class i don't think that at all and i think people like mark mark vernon who asked the question is also holding the space for uh, the true humanistic approach to be by our side, by the side of the scientists. So it's it's a it's a joint endeavor. I tend to think that uh, these people are great souls. I don't know about truth. I couldn't validate that they're true, but I can validate the depth of, yeah. of thinking and, and its importance for me and uh, hopefully for our viewers. It's why we try to talk about uh, both the, the most recent research and uh, some of the you know, important thinkers from the past, uh, and we're at risk of forgetting the past. So it's very important to discuss Dante. Yes, you know, the motto at the Paris Center is the future has an ancient heart from Levy. So this, this encapsulates that intuition. We're heading towards the future with the new tools that we have, the new thinking that we have a lot here, but also we're standing on the great intuitions of the past. Yeah, and also a word that hasn't come up too much today is spirituality. And to look to, I mean, we talk about mystics and so forth, but they're also in uh, history under the terms of spirituality and religion. Totally, yes. Well, thank you all for being with us, and as I like to close all of our programs to, with our viewers and our listeners, you are the reason that 